On this whiteboard session, we'll be talking about the subject of secure gambling. Secure gambling is the area of research inside cryptography where you look at protocols that allow you to play card games and other forms of gambling securely. It has been a subject on, on the cryptographic research literature for about 30 or 40 years since the dawn of modern cryptography. So first let's talk a little bit about what is secure gambling and especially mental poker. In the early 80s, right after inventing the RSA encryption scheme, the same authors proposed to use encryption and public use encryption especially to play a game of poker in such a way that several people can come together from different places in the world and just by communicating and while mistrusting each other, play a game of poker where their cards are represented in some encrypted fashion in such a way that in the end of the game they can prove to each other who won without being without enabling an adversary to gain any advantage in the game this kind of research at the time was still uh, very in its in its beginning so the first results ha had several security and efficiency issues throughout the years several different protocols for the problem of playing poker games have been proposed and they have improved both on the security guarantees and the uh, efficiency of the protocols themselves. However, we noticed that in none of these protocols, people have actually provided full security proofs. So let's now have a brief discussion on related works and the problems that they present. So the first problem, the first issue with related works is the lack of security of formal security guarantees. Even though mental poker has been a subject of cryptographic research for so long, no proper security model has been proposed in the literature up to this day. So all these previous protocols had heuristic security guarantees that were not properly formally defined. This is a problem in the world of cryptographic research because without such formal models it is impossible for us to know exactly what level of security these protocols are giving us and also without analyzing these protocols under a full formal model it can happen that the protocols might have flaws that go unforeseen for years which is actually the case so in some related works we have actually found concrete security issues, apart from the lack of formal guarantees. These concrete security issues range from problems that would actually let an adversary fully control the game to issues that would let an adversary gain some advantage in biasing the output of the game. None of those are, are good and they are not easy to be solved. Uh, with, the, with the protocols that have been proposed previously. So this is one big point to be addressed in this talk and in the work that we did on secure gambling. We need to analyze our protocols to make sure that such flaws cannot happen and that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, another problem with these protocols is that even if they were fully secure and proven under formal models, they still cannot handle the distribution of financial uh, rewards that can be gained in a game of cards or a game of poker itself. So here's uh, one important aspect on how to distribute financial rewards. As well as serving as rewards, financial incentives can also be used to mitigate cheating. In a recent work, Stefan Zimbowski and others proposed a protocol where 
cheaters get financially penalized using the Bitcoin protocol and cryptocurrency. This idea can be extended to other, to other situations where you want to punish an adversary that actively tries to disrupt the protocol when he is detected doing so. This is important to deal with yet another problem that previous works had, which is the situation of aborts. Basically, uh, an adversary that learns the output of the game before the other players and sees that it's not advantageous for himself could simply abort the execution of the protocol in such a way that he's not made to pay the rewards to the actual winner. This is a big problem since uh, it, adversaries could easily disrupt the games in order to avoid, the, uh, avoid pain rewards and that would, that would make the game completely uninteresting for the honest players playing this. Now, how, do we, how can we hope to solve this? As I said, we can penalize financially people who are bored or who misbehave in, in different ways. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to walk you through the basic building blocks that we'll be using to construct a secure poker protocol. These building blocks are threshold encryption, threshold encryption, which is a variation of public key encryption. The discrete log, discrete logarithm, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs and non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs for shuffles. After introducing these building blocks, I'm going to show how they can be combined to construct the protocol we call Kaleidoscope. This is a protocol that can be used to play a game of poker with financial rewards and penalties. So this protocol is analyzed for the first time in a formal model where we have a simulation-based security guarantee, which is the golden standard for cryptographic protocol security analysis. And it also provides support to financial rewards and penalization for aborts and other adversarial techniques. So first, I'm going to start by describing threshold encryption. We are going to use a threshold version of the famous El Gamal crypto system. Threshold encryption itself was first proposed by Ivo Desmet and other researchers uh, in order to allow the power of decrypting a message to be distributed over a set of people as opposed to just one person who holds the secret key of a public key encryption scheme. In this kind of schemes, you start by generating the key pairs with a distributed algorithm. In this distributed algorithm, all the parties who will be sharing the power of decrypting a message run the following protocol. They first locally do key generation in order to obtain secret key shares. To generate secret key shares. These secret key shares are basically secret keys of the regular Algamal crypto system. So this is done by the following. You generate for each party PI a secret key SKI and a public key share SKI by running the standard key generation algorithm that takes as input a security parameter. The secret key share as in the Algamal encryption, is basically a random element from ZP, while the public key share, PKI, is equal to a generator of a group where 
the DDH assumption holds to the power of the secret key. This will be what each party will run locally in the process of generating the key in a distributed fashion. Now, all the parties broadcast these shares. They broadcast PKI, meaning the public key share that they, that they have generated, plus a NISC, a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, that this public key share was generated correctly, so that adversaries cannot cheat and obtain uh, the, the actual secret key that will be generated, the distributed secret key. After receiving the secret key, the public key shares from all the parties, then they will again locally compute the aggregated public key. They will aggregate the PKI shares simply by multiplying them. They multiply public key share one by public key share two up to public key share n, supposing you have n parties, in order to obtain the aggregated public key PK which, as you can see, is basically the same generator to the power of the sum of all secret key shares. Now, they have what looks like exactly a Elgamal key, secret key and public key pair, but no, no single party will actually know the secret key. They will just know additive shares of the secret key. Having this uh, public key and secret key pair, they can easily encrypt by using the same algorithm as standard algorithm. In this algorithm, you take as input a message and encrypt it under the aggregated public key, generating a ciphertext. Now, this ciphertext will look like exactly a Elgamal ciphertext. Same generator G to randomness, to fresh randomness, and then the message times the public key to the power of the same randomness. This will be parsed and understood just as a usual Elgamal ciphertext. Now, Apart from these standard operations and later on distributed decryption, we'll also need a property called re-randomization. Now, this property basically lets us refresh the randomness of a ciphertext. So, assume you have a ciphertext that looks as before g to the r, message times public key to the R. We want to generate another ciphertext that encrypts the same message, but with a different randomness R prime. So how do we do that? We first sample a random R prime from ZP, and then we basically raise each of the terms of the ciphertext to the new R prime, obtaining a ciphertext C prime that looks like this. Now, this ciphertext is still encrypts exactly the same message as before. This is equal. But the randomness is different. The final randomness in the ciphertext will be such that you cannot uh, identify that this ciphertext, this re-randomized ciphertext C prime was actually generated from the initial C. This is a property we'll call unlinkability. Unlinkability is this property under which given a ciphertext C and then another ciphertext C prime, you cannot detect that C prime was generated by re-randomizing C. 
And this property will come in handy when we have to do shuffling of cards. We'll be representing cards as, uh, as Algamal ciphertext, I mean, the threshold version of Algamal ciphertext, and re-randomization will play an important role in shuffling the ciphertexts. Now, another important algorithm in threshold encryption is distributed decryption, by which parties can come together to decrypt a given ciphertext without revealing to each other their secret key shares. Now, distributed decryption will look a little bit like distributed key generation in that it's basically running the locally running the standard algorithm decryption and then broadcasting decryption shares. So the first step is to locally run the following algamal decryption algorithm where you get a ciphertext C, let's recap, G to the R, M times PK to the R, and you compute G to the R to the power of the secret key share generating DI, which we'll call a decryption share. Now, this decryption share is broadcast by all the parties that generated them locally so that they can be aggregated in order to decrypt the actual uh, ciphertext. How can you use this to decrypt the, the actual ciphertext? First, you aggregate all of these in order to obtain G to the R times the sum of all secret key shares, which can be used to decrypt using the standard algamal decryption algorithm, which will give us the final message. Now, in this process, you also need to generate a NISC, a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, proving that this decryption share was indeed generated correctly, meaning that it was generated from the ciphertext that's being decrypted and from the secret key share held by, by the party that's, that's proving decryption share validity. This is important so that parties, malicious parties cannot cheat uh, and try to make the other honest parties think that the decrypted message is different from what it actually is. Now, having this tool, We'll also need the non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs used in both distributed decryption and distributed key generation, plus non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs for the validity of shuffles, which we'll look at, look at now. Um, what we're lo looking at here is a non-interactive version of a zero-knowledge proof for discrete logarithm relations. For the log relations. To shorten this really big, uh, this really big expression, we use the acronym NIZK or NISC. And we, we do have constructions that can be used to prove the relations that we need in the distributed decryption and key generation algorithms. The first relation we need is knowledge of a discrete logarithm. You need to prove that you know the discrete logarithm of a given, a given group element in relation to a generator. Uh, this, the first proof for this, well, not the first, but uh, the most efficient and widely used one was proposed by Shinor in the 80s. And it lets you show that given a public Y and a public base G, you can prove that you know this secret witness. Notice that you never leak 
the exponent e, while both y and g are public. But still, this proof allows you to convince uh, verifier that you actually know the right e, given both y and g that are public. Apart from that, we will also need to prove the equality of discrete logarithms of uh, different values under different bases. So how this is going to look like? This uh, proof will be used for decryption. We are going to be using the proof proposed by Chaum and Pilsen in 92, which allows us to prove a relation that looks like this. Given A and given B that are, that are uh, public, we want to show that the discrete log of A under basis G is equal to the discrete log of B under basis G prime. So in this case, we know publicly G, G prime, A, and B. Those are public, while the actual discrete logs, meaning E and E prime, where G to the E prime is equal to B and G to the E is equal to A, are secret. This proof will allow us to complete distributed decryption correctly. The next non-interactive zero knowledge proof that we're going to need in order to build our gambling protocol is a proof that shows that the process of shuffling ciphertexts has been executed correctly. This is a tool that has been used a lot in the literature of mixed nets and voting. And there's several such NISCs that can actually be employed. The one we choose to employ was uh, proposed by Bayer and Hoth in 2012. And it's a proof of shuffle correctness that scales well with uh, large numbers of ciphertexts and large numbers of parties. Even though in our case, we'll be dealing with a regime where we have just 52 ciphertexts representing the 52 cards in a standard deck. Now, first of all, before we talk about this NISC, we have to define what is uh, the process of shuffling ciphertexts of a public key encryption scheme. So we'll start by answering the question of what's a, what's a shuffle? What do we talk about when we talk about shuffling ciphertexts? First, let's say we have a number of ciphertexts that we have generated using the regular encryption scheme, C1 up to Cn. The ciphertext is just perfectly normal public key encryption ciphertext, and we want to generate another set of ciphertexts such that their orders are permuted and they cannot be related, traced back to the original order. How do we do that? First, we'll start by re-randomizing the initial ciphertext, obtaining C1 prime, which is obtained through re-randomization of C1, up to Cn prime, which we obtain by re-randomizing Cn itself. Now, we remember that the re-randomized ciphertexts cannot be linked back to the original ciphertexts. So if I give you a random C, C, J prime, let's say, you cannot say which C 
of the original ciphertext was related to tweet. So now how can we achieve the actual shuffle? We're going to permute these re-randomized ciphertexts. Now we say we have C1 prime, C2 prime, C3 prime, C4 prime, up to C and prime. We are going to permute them in a random way by choosing a random permutation such that we get C hat one prime, C hat two, C hat three, C hat four, up to C hat n. We simply permute them in a totally random way and by the process of re-randomization and permutation and the unlinkability guarantee, we cannot tell which of these final uh, ciphertexts in the set of final ciphertexts was the original, is related to each of the original ciphertexts in the first set. So we basically say that this set and this set are unlinkable. You cannot reverse the process of shuffling. Now, if we do this correctly, we get a perfectly shuffled version of the original ciphertext where the same messages are still inside of this uh, final ciphertext, but we just don't know which ciphertext contains each message. The problem is that a malicious adversary could, could simply cheat and not re-randomize the original ciphertext, but input ciphertext with messages of his choosing. We have to deal with this kind of attack by requesting each party who does such a shuffling process to provide a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof that this process was done exactly in this way. Now, this, this proof will basically show us that this was executed. This NISC will prove that this whole process, as I have described, has been executed exactly as I have described, and an adversary couldn't have just picked random messages to input in this uh, ciphertext or substituted ciphertext or basically given invalid values. So we will need this NISC of shuffle together with this process of shuffling to actually build the shuffling process of Kaleidoscope, our poker protocol. Now that we have all the tools that we need, let's look at how we actually build the, po the poker protocol we call Kaleidoscope. First, a little bit on the history of the name. We have named this protocol thinking of a 60s movie where a cheater actually manages to identify which cards are being played by tainting each of the cards in the deck. And what we want to achieve is exactly uh, a protocol where this is not possible, where this cannot happen, where you could catch such a guy. Now, the main idea of this protocol, intuitively, is to represent each card as ciphertexts. This ciphertext will just encrypt a card number, say, one from 1 to 52, and then they can be shuffled and distributively decrypted in order to open a card towards a single person or to the public. And throughout the whole process, we're also going to make sure that witnesses are generated, proving that the protocol has been executed up to a certain point, so, such that if somebody later tries to cheat, we can cheaply have a public discussion where people post to the blockchain short witnesses showing up to where the protocol has actually worked, and then the cheaters are forced to reveal themselves if they want to proceed with cheating by providing an invalid message in the blockchain or simply failing to provide one. And when that happens, we can penalize them in order to prevent people from having incentives to actually do these attacks. So they basically will know that if they cheat, if they abort, they will be penalized. That's the whole idea of the protocol 
and also we need to deal with the size of these uh, messages that were posted in the blockchain. The interesting thing is that most of the protocol will just run without any interaction with the blockchain. So now let's look at the phases in which this protocol is executed. First of all, we have a check-in phase. Which is a phase where basically the parties will lock their coins use both as collateral in case they cheat and bets. Now this locking is the first process that actually requires interaction with the blockchain. You have to post a transaction saying you're entering the protocol and this amount of coins are locked to be used to punish you in case you cheat or for you to bet inside the game. After this, the protocol will not touch the blockchain anymore unless somebody cheats. So this is important to, to remark. This goes on the blockchain, but all the rest from here on won't go on the blockchain. And I'm going to remark again the phase, the recovery phase that would require blockchain interaction. Apart from this, in the checking phase, completely off-chain, let me even make a big mark here, this is going to be off-chain, the parties will use the distributed generation algorithm to generate a public key and secret key pair of a threshold algamal such that each party has a secret key share and they all obtain a private key. Uh, I mean a public key. Distributed key generation. Oh, and also they broadcast signature keys. that will be used for generating their, let's call them VK for verification keys, because all the messages in the protocol will be signed by the party generating its messages. From the distributed key generation procedure, everybody will obtain an aggregated public key, PK, and a secret key share, SKI, for each party. Now, with this setup, we are ready to play any number of games that we want without having to regenerate keys or lock more coins. So basically, after we do this check-in phase, we can play poker 10, 100, 1,000 times as long as we still have a positive balance of bad coins that we can use to bet on the game and that we wish to remain. Of course, at any point, the, the players can choose to leave the game and they can do so by posting a message in the end of one hand. Uh, it's just important to remark that this phase, the one with the key generation and key broadcast, will not be required for every single individual game. Now, the next phase is the actual shuffle. For the shuffle, we'll basically use the same uh, procedure that I have just described for shuffling ciphertexts, and we will use the following uh, round-robin strategy. First, we're going to represent cards as follows. C1 is going to be an encryption of 1 up to C52. It's going to be an encryption of 52. All these encryptions are done under the public key that was distributedly generated in the check-in phase. Now, we'll start from this encryption, and each party, each PI, each party PI runs the shuffle. 
the shuffle procedure we just described. This will generate a new set of uh, ciphertexts, C1 prime i for each party pi up to Cn prime i, which will be broadcast together with a NISC showing that this shuffle has been done correctly. Apart from this, of course, all parties check the NISC validity, allowing them to detect if one of the parties has tried to cheat. The idea is that by having each of the parties run the shuffle procedure, none of them in the end actually know what is contained in the last set of ciphertexts, except that all the card IDs from 1 to 52 are actually contained in the ciphertexts. The, the idea is similar to what is done in mixed net protocols and is well understood and uh, well analyzed. So we know that it's a good way to do this kind of shuffling. Uh, once we have a shuffle set of cards in place, we can start actually playing the game by revealing community cards and giving to each people their private cards, which we'll look at right now. In order to actually open a card, what we have to do is to distributedly decrypt the ciphertext representing the card we want to reveal, of course, because that ciphertext will contain the card number and will tell us which card we actually got. So first, let's look at how we can open a card towards one specific person which I'll call the opening of a private card. Towards uh, a specific party, PJ. So, first, all players PI, but the player PJ, compute their decryption shares. which will be g to the r to s k i. And they broadcast this decryption share so that PJ receives it. And other people can also check it later for validity when PJ decides to review his card. Now, PJ itself computes his own decryption share, dj equal to g to the r to the s k j, and he aggregates all the decryption shares, d1 to dn, using them to decrypt the ciphertext. he obtains his card number. Now, notice that the ciphertext representing the card can only be decrypted if you know all of the decryption shares. And in this case, the only party who knows all the decryption shares is PJ. The other parties know almost all of the decryption shares but PJ shares so they cannot learn anything about this card. But PJ can, of course, learn the value of the ciphertext, thus the number of the card. Notice that even though I have left it implicit here, PJ, PI, all the PIs but PJ also generate a non-interactive zero knowledge proof showing that this decryption share was correctly generated. And PJ is going to check these uh, this proofs as well as the other parties will check each other's proofs to see if somebody is trying to cheat in the game and provide bad decryption shares, which would cause the recovery procedure to be activated and then 
um, the, the cheater would be penalized. Now, if we want to open a private, uh, a private card, we do this procedure where only PJ learns it. But we need to have a procedure where we can prove publicly the value of a card, meaning the content, prove that we know the content of a given ciphertext that we generated in our shuffle, which we'll be, we call opening public cards. The procedure for opening public card is basically the same we have described. All PIs generate and broadcast The, their, their decryption shares for decrypting the ciphertext representing the card that's being opened publicly. All of the parties then aggregate the DIs and decrypt the card ciphertext. Again, in this case, they also generate and broadcast a proof that the DIs are correct. So just to make it clear, we have an ISC here that shows that this decryption shares have been correctly generated. The only difference from the public opening of a card and the private opening of a card is that in the private opening of a card, the person who, who, who is receiving this card privately does not reveal their own decryption share, leaving the other people in the dark. But in the public opening, all people can be convinced that the card was correctly open, including people who are observing the protocol execution. With these procedures in, in place, we basically need one more component to have a full game of poker, which is a procedure for taking bets. We need to have a way for, for the players to say if they want to raise a bet or drop out of the game or any actions, betting actions that they can have in the poker game. We do that by broadcasting signatures. So in this procedure, every party PI broadcasts a signature on the batting action they are taking. This signature can be verified by everyone and later used against a cheater if he claims that he did not take a betting action. Notice that the signature we'll call SIG will be generated under the signing key corresponding to the verification key that was publicly broadcast in the checking phase. So all people participating in the protocol know to actually verify, how to actually verify that the signature is correct. Now, this is basically all run off chain, but we are gonna have to describe a uh, process for recovery that will be run on chain. Again, to remark, this is off chain. But the next procedure will require blockchain interaction. In this procedure, we will penalize a cheater or a person who tries to abort during the game. The idea is the following.
if a party PJ suspects cheating, meaning that PJ received an invalid message or PJ failed to receive a message from another party, PJ will complain publicly. What is this complaint? It's a message on the blockchain. This message will say what round PJ, PJ's view of the protocol is, what is the current round, and also it will contain a proof that everything up to the previous round was executed correctly, and will initiate the so-called recovery process. Notice that ev after every single of these uh, procedures of taking bets or opening a card publicly or opening a card privately or generating a shuffle, we have a set of information that we can use to later prove that the protocol has been executed correctly. The interesting thing is that instead of simply posting on the blockchain the whole content of the messages generated in each of these uh, procedures, we generate a compact checkpoint witness. Checkpoint witness. Now, what is this checkpoint witness? This is a signature, or rather a set of signatures that can be aggregated with the Modi signature scheme, saying that the phase has been completed satisfactorily. Signatures agreeing on successful completion. In order to have a valid checkpoint witness, you need to have signatures under the keys of all the parties involved in the protocol. By all parties PI. Apart from the signatures, we also save other information such as the ciphertext representing cards and uh, zero knowledge proofs that the ciphertext have been correctly generated, for example. We can actually drop these uh, this, this proofs in case we have a full checkpoint witness saying that the shuffle was correctly generated but we still will still need to post the ciphertext to show that decryptions of those ciphertexts were correctly generated. Now, notice that this significantly reduces the on-chain complexity of this protocol on the one on-chain heavy phase. Remember that before we have only used the chain in order to lock coins, just standard transactions locking a bunch of coins for the game to proceed. But now we are actually going to post protocol information, meaning checkpoint witnesses and other auxiliary information, apart from the next message that should be generated. Once a complaint occurs, all the other parties, PI, including PJ who complain, will have to post the next message of the protocol after, after this checkpoint was generated. Let's say we have failed at, the, at a betting round uh, where, people were, where somebody should have sent a signature saying their betting action and they didn't send. Well, all the parties will then have to actually post on the blockchain the message for this round, which is their signature on their betting action. After all the parties have posted their next round message to the blockchain, allowing everybody, including third party observers, to verify that the protocol was actually executed correctly, then we can check whether these messages that were posted are valid or not. If one of the messages is invalid, the person who posted the, inv the invalid message is penalized and loses their collateral deposit. On the other hand, if everything is fine, if all the messages are posted on the blockchain and they're all valid, then we can proceed with the protocol. 
So if valid, we proceed. If not, we penalize the cheater. That's basically the mechanic of the recovery procedure. Now that we have constructed procedures for shuffling cards, opening cards, and basic card operations, as well as the recovery procedure to be run to penalize cheaters, we actually have to show how to finish a poker game in the showdown phase, where people either review or muck their cards and determine who won the game. This procedure will be run as follows. Each of the players has two choices, either to muck or to review. So in the order that the game has been played, the, the, the players will, will take their actions. They will either broadcast an opening of their cards. with which they can show that they had a given card using the opening, the public opening procedure that we have established before. Uh, basically, they don't have to run the whole public opening procedure from scratch because the decryption shares by all the other parties are already publicly known. So the party PI revealing only has to uh, send its decryption share plus the NISC. Or you broadcast a signed muck action. Basically, we require a party who wants to muck to broadcast a signature sig on a muck action under the signing key related to the verification key from the check-in, such that everyone can verify that this party is actually mucking. Based on the cards that were revealed and on the rules of poker, then we establish who won the game. This winner will then have its balance increased, or the set of winners will, will have their balance recalculated so that you know how much money each person still has in this game. In order to do this in a publicly verifiable fashion, all the parties PI will sign the new balance that has been determined by the outcome of the game and, of course, broadcast the signature. This will allow anyone to publicly verify the final financial situation of the players in the game and it will allow the players who wish to check, to check out from the game and retrieve their current balance to prove that they actually have those coins in the game so that they can transfer those coins to an address of their choosing. Now we come to the final phase, which is the checkout, where a party broadcasts a checkout action And then, and then, of course, a, a signed checkout action, and then is able to retrieve its current balance. Notice that this phase does not have to be executed after the end of a game. 
you can run any number of poker games with this protocol and only check out after the end of the game where you, where you want to leave the playing field. So you don't, you don't have to run a game, check out, collect your balance, then do the check-in again to run another game. After, what, after the check-in, you can play any number of games and only run checkout when you want to leave, which is good so we don't waste the time that is needed to do the check-in. Now, notice that even though I show these uh, procedures in a more or less modular fashion, they are not actually modular. They have to be run in a specific order determined by the rules of poker in order to achieve security in our model. Meaning that what we, what we have proven is that running these procedures for the game of poker has security, but if we simply mix and match the procedures without, uh, without further, further security analysis, we don't have any guarantee that we'll get a naturally secure protocol. So that brings us to open questions and future works that we are working on right now. What do we have? We have a very specific protocol that works for poker, but it's good that it has formal security guarantees and it's efficient and it has minimal on-chain interaction. But it's still a bit limited in that it can only be used for poker. So one important topic for future works is constructing general card game protocols. Another point that can be improved over our current results is that we, even though we have a simulation-based security model for this poker protocol, it does not guarantee arbitrary composability, meaning that we cannot mix and match and combine this protocol with any other protocol that we might be running in parallel without compromising its security. However, when you run a, a protocol in a complex environment such as the internet and especially as part of complicated blockchain applications, it is important to achieve composability so that we are sure that this protocol won't break when, when combined with different applications and protocols. To solve that, we want to analyze our protocols in the universal composability framework. which shows that, which allows us to show that a protocol actually achieves this kind of security. Both of these points are being addressed in our upcoming paper called Royale. In this paper, we have a protocol that can be used to play any sorts of card games where we can actually mix and match the card operations in any order we like, do them in parallel or anything like that. And we can prove that it is universally composable, meaning that we can actually use it in conjunction with other protocols and more complex applications. If you want to know more about that, soon we'll be releasing a preprint of this paper on the IACR ePrint, so stay tuned for this interesting, exciting new results that are coming. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you have learned a little bit about secure gambling on blockchains.